thank you all for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. Many of the stories we tell at the American Writers Museum involve the idea of home, leaving it, finding it, making it. In A Living Remedy, Nicole Chung reckons with the home she grew up in and the one she's built in the face of loss with insights about American class, race, and political identity. The Washington Post called A Living Remedy Moving and NPR's review read in part, Chung crafts a deeply personal reckoning with our country's entrenched inequalities and an elegy for her parents. Nicole Chung is the author of the national bestseller, All You Can Ever Know, named a best book of the year by NPR, The Washington Post, Time, and many other outlets. All You Can Ever Know was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, a semi-finalist for the Penn Open Book Award, and an Indies Choice Honor Book. Chung's writing has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, Time, GQ, Slate, and The Guardian. She's joined here online in conversation with by Nina Lee Coombs, a writer and TV producer whose work has been published in The Atlantic, Guernica, and Catapult, among other places. She's a film reviewer and a regular contributor at the Chicago Reader. I'm going to welcome both of them back to the room. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you, Nina, for being here as well. Um, and thank you to everyone who's here tonight. Uh, I'm so sorry I couldn't be at the American Writers Museum in person, but I'm really honored that you've chosen to spend part of your evening with us. Um, Nina, did you want to say anything before we get started too? Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say also thank you. It's so great to be able to do this with you um, and also be a part of programming with the American Writers Museum, who's long had programs that I've really admired. Um, and I am so excited to hear from you and your work, Nicole. So I will just hand it back to you. Thank you. Um, apologies in advance to everyone. I'm still getting over COVID. And so every now and then um, you might hear a cough. But I, I did want to start just by reading a little bit from the very beginning of the book, um, just kind of drop you into the story and then, and then we'll have our conversation. I can picture her one pale freckled cheek resting on the yellow floral pattern pillowcase next to mine, warm brown eyes half-lidded with sleep as she listened to me talk. She was often tired in those days. After walking in the door, she'd greet me, drop her purse in a chair, and then go lie down for a while before dinner. Sometimes I'd follow her down the hallway to my parents' room the second door on the right, and chatter at her from the doorway or my dad's side of the bed. She'd respond now and then, ask the occasional question. If she fell asleep, I'd tiptoe away. When I was little, we'd sit side by side on her bed while she told me stories about her girlhood, taught me my prayers, got me started on early cross stitch and crochet projects and read me stories she loved. A Little Princess, Anne of Green Gables, Pride and Prejudice. By the time I was a senior in high school, I was mostly just looking to talk, to tell her about my day. The tests I had coming up, the school musical I wanted to try out for, plans my friends and I made for the weekend. I probably should have known to leave her in peace. She wasn't in good health then, which I didn't fully understand. No matter how exhausted she was, she never sent me away. I wonder if she ever thought about how soon I'd be leaving as the two of us lay on the squeaky old mattress, late afternoon sunlight filtering through the sheer brown curtains above us. I wonder if that's why she let me gab when she got home from work why she didn't tell me to let her rest. Soon we'd no longer be sharing a roof and she wouldn't hear much about my individual days, only the sum total of whatever I could remember after a full week of classes and papers and books and dining hall meals. On a Sunday afternoon phone call made with one of dozens of calling cards she mailed to me. We would still belong to each other but we would come to know one another differently in separation. 
in parting after parting. <clears throat> I didn't know what it would mean to leave. Wouldn't begin to grasp it till my last night in my little blue childhood bedroom. A few months later, when I found I couldn't sleep for terror and wonder. I'd spend most of my life in a small house in a small town, a Korean adoptee who knew I was loved, but often felt as though I were living a life meant for someone else. The dreams of escape had long held me in thrall. I missed my parents when I spent any length of time away from them. And my mom was the person I most wanted to talk to at the end of the day. <clears throat> I'm sure plenty of people who knew me were surprised that such a homebody only child had set her sights on a life 3000 miles away. It would be years before I'd understand that she was the one all along who'd been preparing me to go, who wanted me to have the choice. I think of those late afternoon talks now that I have my own children knowing that the days of both of them falling asleep in their rooms down the hall from mine are dwindling. That a time will come when something trivial or life-changing will happen to them. They'll be hurt or caught by surprise or find they're happier than they've ever been. And I will not be the first person they tell. That might be why I sometimes let them stay up past bedtime, chatting with me or getting silly with each other. Why even the brightest moments on the best of days can crack my heart wide open. But then sometimes I think, well, no matter where they go, no matter how far apart we are, maybe I'll always be someone they think to call, someone they want to talk to. Because my mother's far beyond my sight, beyond the reach of my voice. And not a day goes by when I don't think of something I wish I could tell her. Thank you. <clears throat> this is the part of the program where it went virtual. You're all the <laughs> just imagine. <laughs> pause. So just me, just me for now. Um, thank you so much for reading that aloud. Like I said before we started, I selfishly wanted to hear the the work in your voice, um, which is connected to the first question I have for you, which is about voice. Uh, this book is so full of really beautiful, intimate portraits of your parents. Um, and one of the ways that you portray them is in their voice. There's a lot of dialogue, there's a lot of spoken um, word within the text. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it was like to write in their voice and recall them in this way. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, I think quite often in this book and, and you've written a lot of personal work and beautiful essays and memoir and you know, so you'll know this as well, but so much of the, the work is this active memory work and really trying to like summon the people that you're writing about, uh, the people in your life. Um, and sometimes people who aren't close to you, like aren't there anymore, like to ask. Um, and so a lot of channeling their voice and, and trying to get that on the page was just trying to make sure they had a voice in this book. Um, I think it's really important reading memoir. Uh, I know as a reader, I'm always looking to see, well, who else is in this besides the author? Do they feel like real, like whole developed characters? Can I hear other voices besides just one? Um, mm -hmm. And it was also just important, I felt, for anyone to be able to care about the story and understand the stakes, understand the history and how my parents and I got to this point like they really had to know them and they had to know who they were before they got sick um, mm -hmm. and before they passed, just like, so that in a way, I didn't want their story to come across as like this American tragedy, um, even though certainly elements of the story are very sad. I always saw my parents as fighters, as people who struggled and resisted and loved very deeply um, mm -hmm. and you know, never stopped fighting. Uh, so it was it was something that I really wanted to be able to show. And one of the easiest ways, the best ways to do that was just by letting them speak on the page for themselves. Mm. Were there any primary source documents is not quite the right word, but like memories or objects that you went back to to sort of help you in that process? I mean, there are a few different things. Um, I I always, you know, go back to um, like journals when I write memoir. Mm -hmm. I've kept a journal since I was like six. 
Um, oh, wow. I know, so like really far back. <laughs> Not that the six-year-old entries were very helpful, um, but like for instance, there's parts of the book where um, I honestly didn't remember like exactly what month or in what order something had happened. And um, mm -hmm. for part of it, my mother was alive and I was able to ask her mm -hmm. for other things. I, I really did kind of go to the journals and see, okay, like when did this particular event happen? Um, like when was my father diagnosed and when did he start dialysis and, you know, these sorts of things that I knew were very important events and I remembered them happening, but like, couldn't tell you the month, right. Or the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so honestly, my journals were very, very helpful. And um, I think to just, I wouldn't call them interviews, but there's, there's so many conversations with my mom. Like I can point to so many scenes and stories in this book mm -hmm where she's the source. My mother was the family storyteller long before I was. Even mm. many stories like about my dad's childhood and upbringing in Cleveland, like I got those through my mother. My dad was not really the sort of person to like tell a lot of stories about himself, but my mom mm -hmm. would love to tell a good yarn. Um, and so there's so many, so many things where like, I'm remembering like conversations with her. Um, and I think that's part of that active memory work I was talking about, just like trying to put myself back in those moments, almost like hear her voice telling me things, um, and then kind of channeling that into the story. Wow, that's so beautiful. I, I know that I'm kind of, I'm riffing here, but I, I'm wondering if you see that habit of journaling, uh, which by the way is making me feel like forlorn feelings towards the many like open, unfilled notebooks that I have bought with the intention of journaling, that aside. <laughs> Do you think that journaling is sort of in inheritance of that storytelling tradition of your mother's? Is it kind of your way of narrativizing or has it felt separate? Like that is your voice, it's your place where you've been writing and sort of trying to tell your own story. That's an interesting question. I mean, my mother only, she kept a journal when she was young. I remember reading mm -hmm. like one of her road trip diaries from when she was a teenager, like in the family station wagon, like they were traveling across the country for the summer. Mm -hmm. um, it was largely complaints about her little brothers, but um, <laughs> my mother, as far as I know, didn't really keep a journal when she was older. She did write like letters and cards, like really heartfelt, not always long, but I mean, I always loved getting mail from her in college and, and after it was something she sent me mail her whole life um it was just like a way she had of reaching out and, and being close and it would include a lot of like what you might call minutia about what was going mm -hmm. on in her life but that was the day-to-day -day stuff that I was missing so I was always glad mm -hmm. to hear it um I think journals are pretty essential to my work as a writer not only as sources but like I'm asked many times and maybe you have been as well like is writing memoir like cathartic and I don't personally find it cathartic but I recognize that writing can be catharsis and for me like it's a very clear separation but like journaling is where I do that um it's almost I mean it's downloading in the same way that you would like have a conversation with a really trusted friend or like a phone call and you could just you just need to like say what's happening I think that is catharsis and I think that has great value um it's not by the time I turn to the page to actually write something meant for public consumption, that's not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking so much about readers and what they might take and what they can mm -hmm. hold on to. But the writing for me, um, that's journals, it's letters to some degree. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I think, so I think it's important to my process to kind of have that place for writing that isn't, isn't meant to be shared. Mm. Yeah, I think that's so useful. I feel like I can definitely use that with some of my students, like, you know, journal entries. This is maybe just for you. Um, regarding your mom and her habit of sending mail, there is a refrain that goes throughout your book, which, it, which are these sort of like panels of things that your mother gave you, um, things that you were taking. Can you talk about how those came into being? Were they always in the book or is that something that was added back after looking back at that narrative yeah so the what you're referring to are the three lists in the book and there's one very early on of things my mother sent me after I left home um and then you know a little past the middle I suppose there's another list of things I sent to my mother while she was dying and those lists are very I, th I guess those were always there from at least fairly early drafts um I wanted, it was a way of kind of playing with form a little bit and also like a break, like a breath in the narrative. I was aware it's like in many ways, it can be quite intense. 
And mm -hmm. I did look for places to have like real joy and humor and like levity, but I also like what those lists do is, I mean, they're funny, they're poignant, they're mm -hmm. like, um, but they're also like, I think a real break, like a space for readers mm -hmm. to just like receive that information and breathe a bit. Um, and I was, I was intrigued how much information you can actually convey about a person or an event, like through a list like that. So mm -hmm. I haven't really ever made use of them in my writing before, but it just seemed to work for this. And those two lists I just mentioned of things we sent to each other at different points in our lives, I mean, they kind of serve the same function for both of us. They were about reaching out and trying to be close, um, even though we couldn't be close physically. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I went to school 3000 miles from home and then lived that same distance away. Um, and when my mother was sick, it was very hard for me to get home often because partly because of the pandemic. So I think it was just a way I was trying to show our connection and our care and also how we were trying to make up for some of that distance. Um, mm -hmm. And then the last list toward the end is a list of things my mother left me. And it's a mix of mm -hmm. like concrete things like her earrings that she'd stopped wearing. Um, <clears throat> And like she, I don't know, she had beautiful, like this Raku bowl above me. <laughs> I don't know if people mm -hmm. can see it, but it, it was from my mother. Um, and it was made by like a friend, a ceramicist. So like those things, but then also like the things that you can't touch or put on a shelf mm -hmm. or look at, like the, um, uh, I don't know, like a belief that, that like it's going to be okay. Like my children are mm -hmm. going to be okay. And a more expansive definition of the word okay you know things like that so that that list is like a little um it's not all concrete items but it's in a way it's the same as the other two lists and that it's it's very much an expression I think of who my mother was and our relationship mm -hmm. and like that that care yeah I definitely see that um you mentioned that the lists were in earlier drafts of the book which brings me to my next question looking back at the first draft of this book and now the draft, not draft, the actual iteration of the book that's in our hands, um, what evolutions do you see happening between those drafts? What are the biggest changes? Um, and maybe what are some things that have really stayed and been the sort of solid base note throughout? Um, you know, things that have stayed for sure, like the, um, the relationship between me and my mother, that being sort of the emotional heart of the story, like the book did not always begin and end with that. Um, but I think that like, that was very much at the core of the book. Um, and then, I mean, I think the biggest difference between like my early terrible draft um, and hopefully where we ended up is like the book actually has a structure that makes sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was really, uh, I'll riff a little bit too, like this is, very much not the book I thought I would be writing. At the time that I sold it, it was a grief memoir, but very focused on the death of my father um, mm -hmm. and how his death was sped by inequality and a lack of access to healthcare for many years and financial precarity and all these things. Um, and, and then at the time my mother was not only alive, but did not have a terminal diagnosis. And so mm -hmm. I'd envisioned the book as one where I would be talking with her a lot and we would be comparing notes and that sort of, I don't know, I just, when, when she was diagnosed with cancer, everything changed very quickly. Um, and it was a long time then before I could really think about the book again, because I was mm -hmm. very focused on her and my family. But when I did sit down and realize, okay, if I'm still going to write this, it's a completely different story. And mm -hmm. I never imagined I'd be writing about the death of both of them in this two year span, but now I am. You know, if, if there's a way to even do that, you know, what, what on earth can be the structure? How do I make that fit? Um, and it, I really ended up leaning much harder into that mother-daughter relationship and telling my dad's story, but through, not through my mother's eyes, but through the lens of that relationship um, and things she had told me and shared with me. And so once I figured out how important her voice and her stories and that connection really was to also like the part of the story that was more focused on my dad that kind of unlocked the rest of it um mm -hmm. but yeah the lists were there pretty early on at least the first two my editor actually suggested mm -hmm. the third a little bit later in the process but many other things shifted and moved around and I ended up rewriting the entire book like kind of from the beginning um during the pandemic just because so much 
had changed and the world had changed Mm -hmm. and that was what the book needed um but yeah there are definitely certain beats um like I guess you could say the themes were were set very early on it's just that the form ended up being very different than I expected Mm, wow um there's something that you were talking about in this answer and also in the answer previous which is this um Mm -hmm your father's death and the way that it reflected various inequalities, inequities in American society. You also use this word American tragedy to describe um, his death. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what you mean by American tragedy first. Um, And then I have a million follow-up questions, but I'll leave those for after you're done. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, it was something that really led me to want to tell the story in the first place was um, after he died I was grappling with so much anger and so was my mother at just the injustice of like when and how we lost him my father died at 67 and yes he had serious illnesses and genetic predisposition to those illnesses but neither one of us believed I still don't believe that his death that young was in a, like inevitable um, so my parents didn't have health care for most of my life, at least not steady health care. And at the time, my father was get, growing much sicker and was actually like in late stage renal failure. It was like the time in his life when health care was like the most inaccessible to him. Um, he'd been denied Social Security disability insurance. My parents had found the safety net, like other types of assistance, just completely um, inaccessible. And so the very, very last part of the safety net that finally caught him was um, he went to a federally qualified health center in their area. And that was where he was finally like seen and finally helped. But by then he'd been trying for two years to Mm -hmm. to get help. And, um, And there had just been so much damage done. So I remember talking with a friend about this after he died. And um, it was a friend who was sharing some similar things that had happened in their family. And she said something at one point that just stayed with me. It was, she said that, you know, his was a a very common American death. And that really snapped a lot of things into focus for me because I had been trapped in this cycle. And I think my mother had as well of like blaming ourselves for like what we couldn't do to help him because that's what you do in a very like capitalistic society that's focused on individual responsibility um, at the expense of everything else. Like I I knew these systems had failed him but I was so focused on what I saw as like my personal failure. Um, And when my friend said that, I just, I started to think about how many other people are up against similar things in this country, how, you know, unless you are very wealthy, chances are you are facing illness or emergency or loss without, without the support and without the resources that you need. It's such a common part of what it is to grieve in this country. Um, Mm -hmm. It's always, it's often in the background of a lot of stories. And I felt it was worth maybe bringing to the foreground because Mm -hmm. it was so crucial to how, like we lost him and why we lost him. And I felt there was actually no writing about our grief without really facing that head on. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, that was, that was something that I really wanted to be able to explore, partly because I hadn't seen it in a lot of other Mm -hmm. grief stories. Um, And it just, I don't know, it was just something that I felt was important. Yeah, I, I really noticed that in this book. And I really appreciated the care with which you described the logistics of having people who are undercared for and underserved by our health systems um, go through the process of dying. Um, you do that by talking about the social security disability, which your father applied for the first time, was denied, and then applied for again and was accepted. Um, you also have a portion talking about Medicaid and using your own savings and having this kind of like backup option to care. I think that was to pay for your mother's home care. Is that correct? Yeah. And so I know that you've talked just now about sort of why the articulate articulation of the larger problems was really important, but can you talk a little bit about this intentional decision to include these really bureaucratic processes in what otherwise might have just been, in I think in a lesser writer's hands could have been more about the emotional landscape of grief only. You've given us a lot of like very tangible places to understand how it is that people die in this country. 
I mean, that's really what it came down to. I, it was something I felt I, I wanted to confront and honestly was actively confronting in my own grief. Um, the circumstances of my parents' deaths were very, very different. Like my father um, passed away at 67. By the time my mother got her terminal diagnosis, she was 68, just qualified for, for social mm -hmm. security and Medicare. Um, and so paying for like a lot of her care was not the same level of worry that we'd had with my mm -hmm. dad. However, as you mentioned and picked up on like home health care was a huge expense and she wanted to stay mm -hmm. at home as long as possible. Um, mm -hmm. There was, I mean, there's a couple of moments I remember from, from that whole process, like one being um, when she was dying, she was in hospice care and I was just doing the math and realizing like, if she had longer to live, this would bankrupt all of us. Like it just wasn't mm -hmm. possible to pay like thousands of dollars per week indefinitely. And yet, of course I was hoping for more time with mm -hmm. her. And then there was a moment, oh, and so like the, the amount of money that we actually had available like it wasn't enough for her to live on. And I realized like, it's just enough for her to maybe die on, which felt incredibly wrong. Mm -hmm. And like something mm -hmm. I shouldn't be calculating, but I mm -hmm. was because it was my job to pay the bills and keep her mm -hmm. lights on and all of that. And then there was another moment after her death when the home healthcare agency just like sent me an email and, you know, expressed their sympathies and said like, by the way, please like watch for and pay the next two bills because, so I just remember how it felt to be writing a check for like thousands of dollars for my mother who had just died, like for that care. And of course, home health care is, um, it's undervalued and people who do it should be appreciated and paid more. Um, mm -hmm. But it was just this moment of like, what you're saying exactly like there, you want to actually be able to focus on the emotional effects mm -hmm. of what you're going through. And at the same time, there's all these things you have to do. It really is kind of a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, and it felt important to mention because these systems are part of how we experience emergency and illness and death in this country. Like there's there's no escaping it. And, and in so many ways we were fortunate to have mm -hmm. access to what we did with my mother. Um, we didn't have that when my father was sick. And at the same time, um, it was an extremely like, difficult thing to navigate you know mm -hmm. it kind of became a second job for me just like mm -hmm. the research the calls the talks with social workers figuring out like what her options were explaining those to her in ways she could understand as her illness advanced um it was all incredibly difficult um as was having end of life conversations with her at all you know mm -hmm. and at the same time it felt so important um and almost like a privilege and a, a duty because her wishes are important. And mm -hmm. it was my only chance to sort of see that they were honored. So um, yeah, I, I don't know, it just felt like, again, in the same way that confronting sort of American inequality felt really essential to telling the story of how and when and why we lost my father, kind of tackling all of this is felt really important to explaining what it was like when my mother was sick. And again, these are such common, common experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have two other sort of themes that pick up in the book related questions. And then the other questions I have are more largely about your writing life. But the first one um, is one that just came to me as you were speaking, which is one thing that I picked up a lot on in the book. And I think other, reader, other, other readers will too, was the importance of uh, faith for your mother, in particular, the faith community and the people in the Orthodox Church that sort of surrounded her and cared for her, um, your interaction with the church as you also cared for her, um, even as you write in the book that you were, you are not part of the Orthodox tradition um, and you're not in that church, but you had to interact with it because your mother's wishes and her desires were important. Could you talk a little bit about that experience? Um, why did you decide to include that in the book? Uh, what was it like to write that part of this narrative? My mother was so devout and really so committed to that community. And I admit there were years when I did not understand why. Um, we'll just say most of the years <laughs> she was part of it. I didn't, didn't really understand. I didn't, um, I didn't grow up in a community like that. My mother was a convert to Orthodoxy. She went to this small like mission parish where everyone knew everyone. Everybody was in everyone's business. I don't like that sort of thing. <laughs> and like, it just... I don't know, like everyone I'd ever met there was very kind, but I could not ever quite understand why 
it was so important to her, you know, they were just wired differently. Um, but I was just so moved when she was ill to see how like they rallied around her. And actually, even before then, when my father was sick, um, things like, you know, he, uh, my father's mobility had declined and it was mm -hmm. a fellow parishioner who was a contractor who outfitted their home with like ramps and railings mm -hmm. and made sure it was accessible for him and safe for him and did this like at cost, you know, um, when he passed away, the same person made his casket and everybody from the parish brought like a meal to the reception after the funeral so that my mother didn't have to pay a caterer, you know, just things like that. Um, I don't know. It was just, again, like I felt like an outsider in that community <clears throat> I was, but it, it really touched me to see how my parents were like seen and appreciated and embraced there. Um, and I saw it again when my mother was ill and in hospice, she started hospice right as the pandemic was starting. Um, but she had, I mean, a few visitors from the church who would come masked and bring food and like her priest continued to visit her. Everybody was just really clearly there for her. And at some point it hit me like, oh, these people are her family. Like, of course I'm her family, but I'm not there. They're actually there on the ground um, supporting her. Even some of the hard conversations my mom and I had to have about advanced directives and her will and things she did not want to talk about at all, but we sort of had to. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to have those discussions if her friends from the church hadn't been there to kind of back mm -hmm. me up and like support her in that. So I don't know, that was just a very important, it was obviously everything to her. And I, I wanted to be able to write about that community too, because that's what like we do in when we're confronted often with inadequate support or failing systems it's community is part of how we try to still care for each other because mm. it is our obligation and it can be a joy to care for each other mm. in spite of how hard it is in spite of the structural failings um it was just one place where i felt it would be important to like show i don't want to like say like put a positive spin on it like that makes everything okay it obviously doesn't but it was just so important like for me to see that community mm -hmm. at work for them so um yeah that was kind of like why that ended up in there I was kind of surprised honestly mm -hmm. when it appeared but I think it's a very important part of the story yeah I definitely see how that sort of you know, maybe another word for it is mutual aid, this way that we come together in lieu of the failures of our American systems that definitely came across. Um, another theme in your book that I wanted to ask you about is poetry. Poetry exists in the epigraph and is referenced throughout your book. Um, following you on social media, I know you're a big reader of poetry too. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of poetry in this book? Um, but also maybe just as a writer of prose, where is poetry fitting into your writing practice? Um, I'm so jealous of what poets do. Like it really <laughs> makes me and always has. Poetry's always like, kept me company. Some of the mm -hmm. first books my parents got me and like they were some of my favorites were like these illustrated treasuries of um, poems. So mm -hmm. I don't know, I just always loved them. And I did read a lot of poetry during the pandemic. Um, I admit part of that was because um, it was just right for my pandemic attention span. <laughs> I was like, mm -hmm. yes, I can read like two pages and then stop. That sounds great. Um, but I mean, I read a lot of poetry anyway. And I, I don't know. I think one of the things I was hoping this book would do was to kind of have um, the emotional honesty and the depth and the, the openness and the spareness that I really admire about like many favorite poets. Um, what they're able to do with an economy of language. I know I'm not a poet, but I wanted to try to have this book keep people company, I guess, maybe in the way that poetry has kept me company. Um, so I don't know, it, it just, it just kind of, I wasn't actually trying to inject mm -hmm. poetry in the book, but it, it does appear. And I think it's just because it, it means so much to me, particularly um, some of the poets that I mentioned in the book. I, I don't know, there is something, um, there's something about this, this book that is more, I think, lyrical than some of my other writing. I really entered this kind of like meditative state sometimes while writing it. And I think some of that was because I was 
like reading so much poetry and thinking about it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I wanted, I just wanted the writing to feel like that open and that free. Mm -hmm. That definitely comes across. And I love the idea <clears throat> of poetry keeping you company, um, which also brings to mind Peggy, your beloved dog <laughs> who keeps you company throughout the book. Um, I know that we are entering sort of the last four minutes of our questions between you and I here. So I'm going to give you the next one as a two-parter um, and then we'll turn it over to Allison and the folks in the audience. But this question is about um, what you do and also what's next for you. The first part of it is to first shout out how great of an editor you are. That's the first way that we met. Uh, you've edited my work and I think and about the generosity with which you edit all the time. So that question, the first question is, do you edit yourself as you write? How does that part of your brain live alongside the writer part of your brain? Um, and then the final question is the ubiquitous one that we, I just would have to ask because I'm nosy and I wanna know, um, what is next for you, whether it's a book project or something smaller that you're looking forward to? Um, so the first question, thank you so much, by the way, I really miss editing your work specifically, like, <laughs> that was just always such a joy. Um, I miss editing in general. Um, and sometimes when I, when I realize that I'm like, oh no, because <laughs> I don't know, I think it'd be hard. <clears throat> I think it'd be hard to go back to like a full-time editorial role, but I do love it and I miss it so much. And I will never say never. I mean, mm -hmm. but I do wish there was a way to like dip in and out of editing because mm -hmm. I don't know, I just always loved it so much. Um, I do unfortunately edit myself a bit when I write. I've had to, I joke that like the editor part of my brain is like trying to ruin the writer part of my <laughs> brain's life um, mm -hmm. or something, but I've actually had to like take the kind of extreme step of like setting aside separate days for, for drafting mm -hmm. and for revision. Like I won't let myself try to like go back and forth like maybe a normal person would um I just like I have to tell myself okay we're drafting we're generating we're not judging we're not editing mm -hmm. because I will edit the same sentence like a hundred times um so I don't know I think I think I just kind of had to compartmentalize that way and like be very firm and tell mm -hmm. myself today's a writing day or it's like a revising day I mean they're both they're both forms of writing revising is writing mm -hmm. but um I cannot try to do them kind of at the same time. And my editor brain makes it really hard to turn off. So mm -hmm. separation's key. Um, I do think having been an editor means I have a lot of faith though in the revision process. And so there are many times with this book where I felt like a little bit hopeless. It just, it just seems so daunting. And I was like, how can I write a book about this of all things? Um, and maybe some of it was the fact that I have that editorial history that made me believe and like trust myself and trust in in the process because I may not feel like it's going to be good but I have seen so many times with other writers um, how work gets better how you can actually mm -hmm. dig in and improve and find something that unlocks a story um, and so having seen that over and over means I do have an easier time believing in it in my own work, even when it's not going well. Um, as for what's next, I'm actually in production edits on um, a, a young adult anthology. Um, it's all short stories. They're all by adoptees of color. It's my first book in like the YA space. Um, so I'm excited about that. It's actually out later this fall. Um, I'm freelancing, so I'm always kind of doing new things there, and I would love mm -hmm. to keep pushing in that area and hopefully get a chance to do more like reported features and profiles next mm -hmm. year. Um, I've started a novel that I'm not talking about, <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's kind of, it's been it's been fun and it's been a place to play. So we'll see where it goes. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's hard to say for sure what's next, other than I know that anthology will be out later this year. Well, I am looking forward to that. Um, also, I will hand it over to you and the audience. Thanks so much, Nina. Thank you so much. And thank you for that wonderful conversation, both of you. Um, just to remind folks, uh, you can check out the chat for a link to purchase A Living Remedy with a signed book plate from Nicole in, at Seminary Co-op. So we'll post that link in the chat right now. 
And also, if you have a question, please type it into our Q&A box. So we're looking through those and we'll ask some of those some of those questions now. Our first question for Nicole is about what is not in the book. Uh, Lily, oh. wants, Lily, <laughs> Lily wants to know what parts did you cut out to emphasize your overall message? That's a good question. Um, I mean, it's so hard to remember. I went through a lot of different revisions. I, um, I initially had, let's see, I think initially there was more about um, my relationships with people in my birth family, like my sister and my birth father. And I just didn't quite fit in the story. And most of it, all but like a paragraph really wound up being cut. Um, my sister is in this book for like a full chapter or two, but um, that was kind of all that would fit. And so I didn't mind this at all. Like I wrote an entire book about searching for my birth family and, and those relationships, but it's still, um, I don't know. I did save some of that stuff. So who knows if I'll ever do anything with it, but that's, that's one thing I can think of. I have a question from Sharif who wants to know, based on your experiences and family moments, not just in this book, but overall experiences, what is one thing you wish you could change about life in America or society that would make it a better place? Oh gosh, there's like so many things. How long do we have? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, something I alluded to before is just, we have this real tendency in our society to focus on personal obligation and responsibility. And of course, like you don't have to look any farther than the, than the pandemic to see the ongoing pandemic to see why that doesn't work and why it leaves so many people behind and why it lets so many failing systems completely off the hook. Because when everything is just on you or, or even like on your family or on your community, um, you know, it, it just kind of, it, it distracts us from the reality. I think that we have so many like structural failings that really need addressing and need addressing on like a, a systemic level. Um, so I guess that's, it's one big obvious thing that would affect so many other um, things that need to be changed in this country. Next question is from Brittany who says, writing and remembering so many large and difficult things was likely very draining. So how did you manage? What were your strategies for continuing to tell and finishing this story? Um, thanks for that question. So I had to develop a completely different relationship to my work and writing to write this book um, up until this. I've always just been kind of a person who sits and pushes through and hits all my deadlines. And even if I'm not feeling it, like I keep the butt in the chair and I just make it happen. Um, and, you know, there's a line in the book about what it was like trying to promote my first book right after my father had passed away. Um, it was a line about like grieving under capitalism and you know what it did to me when I realized that's what I was doing and what so many people in this country are kind of forced to do. Um, so I already knew that like to some degree that work ethic that I'd always been kind of proud of was not always serving me or the work very well. Um, but with this book, it just demanded so much. Like it demanded everything that I had. Um, and I had to like show myself a lot more patience and grace and actually learn to take breaks and ask for extensions when I needed them. Um, there were times when I would write just a very hard section of the book and I would just need time, like a day, a week, whatever it was before I could go back in. Um, and there were certainly days where I worked like eight, 10, 12 hours. I mean, that happens too. But sometimes working on this book just meant coming in for a few minutes, like being in the world of the book um, and like realizing I wasn't capable of a lot that day and like putting it down. Um, and that some of this probably sounds very obvious, but to me, it was revolutionary because I had never really allowed myself that space or that grace or that rest in my work. Um, I think we all deserve those things and not because it makes us more productive or makes the writing better just because we're human and we deserve them. But I also know that like changing my relationship to writing and work helped me write this book and like I wouldn't have been able to do it without that. I don't think it would have been this book or like the book I needed it to be. So I don't know. And then like, of course I have like a lot of like self-care routines. I don't know if you're interested in those, but um, I think the big thing was just recognizing like I'm a human, I'm not a robot after all. Um, 
I need to write like a human and treat myself like a human. A couple of questions about the nature of memoir. Uh, the first is from Candace, who wants to know, in writing memoir, how important is the chronology of what happened as opposed to writing about specific feelings? And does memoir permit poetic license based on actual events or feelings? Well, those are two separate, very big questions. Um, so I feel it's hard. With, with storytelling in general, I feel structure is everything. And um, you know that you kind of have figured out the story when you figured out the structure and how you want to tell it. Um, I think in terms of um, with this book in particular, like I knew it was, well, first of all, I knew it was going better when I found I could actually work on it and like not hate everything. Um, I don't, like, I don't believe you can not tell the truth no more. I think that's pretty much the only requirement <laughs> that I could think of is that it, it be true. But of course, like poetic license is involved uh, from the beginning because you are one person sharing one perspective on this story that involves many people. Um, and I have thought often about how if one of my parents were to write this story, um, it would be completely different. It wouldn't necessarily, it's not that either one of us wouldn't be telling the truth. You still have to tell the truth, but I think it's fair to recognize you can kind of only tell your truth and share your perspective. Um, so I don't think you can change the facts, but I do think that, um, you know, it's, it's important to remember, and maybe this makes it feel more doable, actually, like you're showing people kind of a slice, you're showing them, you're asking them to look with you at a particular view, but there are all these other views that, you know, you might hint at, you might describe a little, but like are going to be very hard to really show them with that same level of detail. I feel like I'm drifting from the question. I'm sorry. Um, but I don't know if that answers it. Sorry. Um, it just, yeah, I could riff about memoir for a while. Um, but that, I think that's the main thing is like, tell the truth, but remember you're just human and it's only really the truth that you're qualified to share. Like that truth is yours. I also have a question from Tanya who wants to know about writing a memoir at a younger age. Um, is that something that do we, we think of memoir as something that people do when they're, when they're older, they write their memoirs. So what, um, what prompted you to, to decide to write it at a younger age? Um, well, I mean, gosh, I don't think of myself as that young, but I will say like, I'm very grateful I didn't write um, either of my books like in my 20s, which is not to say you shouldn't write memoir in your 20s, just that I was not ready to tell, well, this the events in this book hadn't happened and I wasn't ready to tell the story of like my adoption, uh, which is this, this, the subject of my first book. I really wasn't ready to do that until, until it happened. Um, so I don't, I'm not really big on like hard and fast rules, like be a certain age before you tell a certain story. But I do believe that people should be honest with themselves and recognize how they're feeling. Uh, do they feel ready to really share something? Are they ready for all the ramifications of that? Um, I remember as an editor, I would sometimes get pitched stories and they were from beautiful writers. Um, and I knew someone would be ready to tell this story someday, but I got pretty good at kind of determining when they weren't quite ready to do it publicly. Um, and it was often when, and I hope that doesn't sound condescending, but what I mean is it would be like after several rounds of notes or revisions, like the story as it needed to be told for readers wasn't taking shape. Like there wasn't enough that was outward looking that was really reaching out to readers and giving them something to hold on to. Um, and that's usually one sign that you might not be ready to tell that particular story publicly. Um, so I don't know, just, it also matters very much what you want though and like what you feel is right. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's like hard, like firm rules about, about age and memoir. <laughs> um, if I could just like, please say something really quickly about that. Uh, Nicole is underselling herself because I, in fact, am one of those writers who pitched her something. I pitched you something. I don't know if you remember this way back when you were editing at the Toast in 2015. Oh my gosh! Um, and you responded the kindest, and when I look back now, is really generous um, response, which was that you felt that the thing was more about my parents and not about me, and perhaps was not ready to be published. Um, and then, you know, I kept pitching you, and then finally published something uh, that you edited in 2018, which is to say, 
that process of um, understanding when things are ready for public consumption versus when they're still being written in this private mode, um, I think you definitely have down and I see it as part of that. The way your memoir is instructive in letting us know what can memoir be? So I just want to share that I am one of those writers. <laughs> Been there, I've had that done. Thank you so much for, I mean, sharing that and for not holding it against me. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> We've got a couple of questions about um, from various folks about other writers and memoirists who you admire. Oh man, I mean, there's there are so many. I um, I mean, it's not just like memoir, but like also essays. So um, I don't know. Like, okay, I recently read R. Eric Thomas's new book of essays, which is Congratulations, the Best Is Over, coming out. Like, obviously, Eric is one of the best writers, and he's hilarious. I laughed like literally every page. But also like, it almost surprised me how very touched I was. Like I was moved and like wiping away tears by the end. So I will always be here for anything he writes. Um, favorite memoirs. I mean, I love, uh, so uh, so T. Kara Madden's memoir, um, uh, Long Live the Tribe of the Fatherless Girls. I love uh, Therese Myatt's Heartberries. Um, E.J. Coe's The Magical Language of Others. Um, I'm sorry, as soon as I'm asked about specific books, like many titles fly out of my head. <laughs> but like, those are some um, that like really mean a lot to me. All right, we have quite a few other questions and I wish we could get to answer all of them, but unfortunately we are almost out of time. Um, I'd like to end with a question from Elena who wants to know what helps you be brave in your writing? That's a great question. Um, you know, some of it is sort of what I said before, like having seen it as an editor and now having written two books um, and numerous freelance publications. I mean, I've, I think just like history, history shows that if I stick with it and like, sorry to sound cliche, but like trust the process and know that I'm putting myself through my paces, like as a writer and demanding emotional honesty and demanding my best work, like I know I will get there. Um, it sounds basic, but I didn't really know or believe that like say 10 years ago. That's just something that's kind of come with experience and like repetition. You know you can do it because you have done it before. Um, so that's one thing. And then, I mean, another thing I think is sometimes hard with memoir is like honestly sharing some of the hardest experiences or like the toughest, biggest, messiest feelings that we've ever had. Um, and this is not exactly what you asked, but I'll say like one way I write that um, I don't think of it as brave, but like one way I, I am able to do that is just by like, again, that active memory and trying to remember how certain experiences or moments like conversations with my mother or like huge events felt like in my body. I, I almost can never describe a feeling. I also feel as a writer, if you say that like you're feeling a certain way, you've sort of failed in the writing. You know, but like what I do is try to remember like very much how, what was the physical embodiment of that? What was the feeling in my, I don't know, inside of me? And I think that's helped in so many cases um, to be able to translate and put that on the page. Um, so, I mean, it's sort of like seen throughout a living remedy. And I think I'll probably be using that technique my whole life. Well, Nicole, Lena, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Thank you for answering so many of our questions um, and best of luck in your continued recovery. And uh, we hope to see you in Chicago in person um, sometime, perhaps for the YA anthology. Maybe. We'll definitely ask you back. Thank you so much. Um, it really means a lot. Thank you, Allison and Nina and everyone who's here. Um, I just want to thank Seminary Co-op as well, um, who had ordered books for this event when it was still going to be in person. So if you would like a signed copy, please do order from them and support them. Um, thank you all again so much. Mm -hmm.